Hashtag Justice for Glitter rose to the top of Twitter's list of trending topics back in November of 2018, seeking the revival of Mariah Carey's most argumentally underappreciated bodies of work to date. It had been a good 17 years by that point, and the self-proclaimed Lamely wanted nothing more than for their Moya Mimi to acknowledge a fragment in her career that she'd desperately been trying to detach from since its 2001 release. The ba of the lambs were so ferocious, it had eventually make its rounds across social media, unearthing one of the most hated films of its time, Glitter, and its accompanying soundtrack that had not only surprisingly reached number one on the iTunes albums charts over a decade after its release, but also make a return to the Billboard soundtrack chart. With the head of one of the biggest recording labels to have ever existed using his power and influence to sabotage your career at every turn, that also just so happens to be your ex-husband, the media, and your own family doing everything they can to ruin you, all odds were against Mariah during her so-called flop era, which would unfortunately result in multiple health scares that had gradually transitioned into what felt like a never-ending nervous breakdown publicized for the entire world to see. Over 20-something years ago, the media deemed glamful abomination and Mariah Carey's most underappreciated era, Let the Lambs Tell It, were released. The date was September 11th, 2001. The cliché cult classic known as a glitter was being plagued so hard by critics that it accidentally on purpose soared to mainstream relevancy. Not because its host and star of the film, THE Mariah Carey, was the focus of this project, but because it was so bad that it was just bad. Negative reviews and tabloid exploitational buzz surrounding Mariah's hospitalization, dysfunctional so-called family, and alleged drug enhanced antics guaranteed this triviality that led to its 2001's weakest box office weekend debut. Drawing in a measly $2.4 million compared to some of its cinematographic competitors at the time, like The Glass House and Hardball, and two major dynamics bumping shoulders that had worked against the overall project, the 9-11 attacks and Tommy Mottola. The revolutionized social media chant turned slogan, Justice for Glitter, goes to show the length some stands will go to stir up attention around what they perceive to be an injustice in regards to their faves' careers. This would ultimately become a tactic synonymous to the 2000s decade overload of pop culture consumption. Glitter's social media movement was a success in reviving its film and the film's soundtrack, but decades after Mariah dropped and disassociated herself from the sector of her life entirely, we still are left completely bamboozled and don't know which side of the it truly lies on, or which side of the fence we're on when it comes down to its reputation. Originally titled All That Glitters, as if that makes it any better, in order to really understand the depth of the disastrous monumental moment in pop culture history, we gotta back it up a few years prior to its release. Before she made her screenwriter's debut and before stepping foot onto the big screen, Mariah already knew y'all was going to potentially drag her for filth. In 1998, she signed on to do a James Bond spoof called 00 Soul alongside Chris Tucker, but the film unfortunately, or fortunately, never did quite come to fruition. An opera singer would be her next role the following year in a project called The Bachelor. Right along this time, she sought out to bring a non-biographical, yet biographical film into existence that would later be known as Glitter. A Christina Aguilera burlesque meets Lady Gaga's A Star Is Born type B, if you will. Working alongside screenwriter Kate Lanier, responsible for cult classics like the Ike and Tina biographical drama What's Love Got To Do With It? All That Glitters is a story about nine-year-old Billy Frank who's sent to live in an orphanage due to her unstable mother's inability to take care of her. Confused and lost more than Franklin in the last episode of Snowfall, Billy, played by Mariah, becomes a backup singer for a girl who gives every ounce of Jennifer Lopez realness. If you're picking up what I'm throwing down. After meeting a DJ who falls for her, Billy gets propelled to star status and soon discovers that the DJ dude has a very dark side. Now wait a minute, Mimi. This plot sounds oddly familiar. Although she insists it wasn't autobiographical, the speculations and fans were more than convinced All That Glitters was a first-person POV based on Mariah's real life. The plot, also consisting of Billy's troubled relationship with her mother, had too many similarities to Mariah's own journey to becoming one of the biggest artists to ever exist. On set, she was concerned about the film's director intentionally filming her on her good side. Off set, however, circumstances were way more troubling than anyone could have thought. Mariah was dealing with much inner turmoil. The cause? Her relationship and 1998 divorce to head of Sony Music Entertainment in chief Tommy Mottola, or the devil, according to the one and only Michael Jackson. Persuading your biggest artist to be romantically involved with you isn't some sort of new concept within the music industry. We've all heard those tales of big record execs sleeping with their artists and 
in Mariah's case, she was no different. A whopping 20 year difference between his age and hers set the trap for the controlled environment Mariah was subjected to during the entirety of what felt like 40 tumultuous years of her marriage, but in actuality was no more than four. Following the divorce, she signed an $80 million contract with Virgin Records. The new deal spawned her very first album under them, no other than the glitter soundtrack cultivating a mixture of both original and covers matching the film's early 80s clubby setting. Its lead single Loverboy, with the help of producer Clark Kent, infused a funky sample of the 1978 song Firecracker by the Yellow Magic Orchestra Band. No longer tied to Tommy Mottola, neither romantically or contractually, Tommy was out for vengeance and did everything in his power and oh did he have a lot of it, to sabotage Mariah's career from then on out. After learning about his ex-wife's upcoming film and follow-up album, Tommy set out to utilize the sample before Mariah would get the chance to do so. Upcoming artist and that girl who Mariah still doesn't know, Jennifer Lopez, signed on to become Tommy's next big thing and he made sure she was gonna live up to that. By pushing Mariah all the way out of the way and getting fans to pit Carrie and Lopez against each other. After finding out Mariah was going to use the sample, Tommy went out of his way to gift the sample to Jennifer, who then used it on her track, I'm Real. The original version, not the one remixed with Ja Rule. Which, speaking of are you welly, JLo's Rick James, Mary Jane sample was also a get back at Mariah. Now how is that? Well, because Mariah had recorded a duet-style song with Ja first. Murder Inc. CEO Irv Gotti even confirmed that Tommy intentionally tried to hurt Mariah after Tommy called Irv up early one morning asking him to set up a collaboration between Jennifer and Ja Rule. The I'm Real remix would be released ahead of Mariah's Loverboy, forcing Mimi to remove the sample altogether. Loverboy went on to sample Cameo's Candy, which can arguably be said is the better sample. Somebody in Mariah's camp was seemingly the ops, reporting back to Tommy to tell all about Mariah's upcoming plans and endeavors. She was going through a lot dealing with an ex so-called husband out to ruin her by any means and any recognition of the littlest ounce of sympathy anyone had for Mariah's behind the scenes turmoils dissipated. Along the route of its creative touch-ups, all that glitters would get shortened to glitter and its promo run was in full effect, kicking off on July 17th with an appearance on BET's 106 in Park. Mariah let it be known that she was exhausted but her upbeat demeanor could have definitely fooled us. Following 106 and Park came MTV's TRL and perhaps one of the most blown out of proportion publicized WTF moments in pop culture history. The July 19th appearance either made you want to go see Glitter expeditiously or see whatever it was Mariah had in that ice cream cart on wheels. Is it crack? All jokes aside, with JLo and Ja Rule's I'm Real music video coming to an end on TRL's countdown, Coincidence? Out came an unannounced Mariah pushing a small ice cream cart to the side of the New York residing building, dressed in an oversized purple t-shirt with the word Loverboy airbrushed across it. Taken aback, host Carlson Daly was flabbergasted, and so were all of those in attendance, as well as those below the TRL stage. What began as a surprise appearance on the TRL set had turned into a major spectacle. She took promotional matters for glitter into her own hands since those at Virgin Records were slacking in that department. Her controlling ex trying to halt all plans of Glitter's success was on her mind, and Mariah was going to exhaust every outlet resource she could to make sure his plans didn't succeed. Letters her mom had supposedly written for Carson expressing her love for the host were read aloud by Mariah, who was now in her undergarments not what you think, followed by a strip tease, which was just Mariah taking off the oversized Loverboy tee, exposing a thick stripped halter top and shorts underneath, led Carson to announce to the audience and the viewers at home that Mariah Carey had officially lost her mind. Well, for Mariah, Carson in the TRL set was her choice of therapy. She let it be known to Carson as well. I just want one day off when I can go swimming any ice cream and look at rainbows. You're my therapy session right now, Carson. You see, every now and then, somebody needs a little therapy and today is that moment for me. Mariah's ice cream meltdown was just one of the many names the media deemed the incident. What was supposed to have been a fun, witty surprise appearance, similar to a comedian going off script and picking on its crowd turned into speculated rumors regarding Mariah's mental health. Her erratic behavior was in large part due to her hectic schedule. She'd been working nonstop by that point with little to no sleep, disclosing that she'd been awake for over 24 hours while on a press stop and described herself as eternally jet-lagged on a German television show I don't know if it's day or night anymore. In another interview the same week, she mentioned that she was dealing with insomnia and only got about three hours of sleep a night. She was too tired to even make a second video before the movie soundtrack's release. 
The day after the now infamous TRL appearance, she showed up to Roosevelt Field's Long Island Mall for a glitter Q&A. With a Hello Kitty boombox in tow, Mariah wasn't holding back on how she felt, letting it be known for the umpteenth time that month that she was dog tired. I don't know what I am other than a person that needs one day, like, this is kinda like my day off. Also letting the haters, like Howard Stern, have a piece of her mind before her publicist, Cindy Berger, attempted to yank the mic from her against Mariah's will. Not even a week later, two alarming audio messages had been posted to Mariah's official website. I just want you to know that I'm trying to understand things in life right now, and so I really don't feel that I should be doing music right now. I just can't trust anybody anymore right now because I don't understand what's going on. Another longer and more exaggerated message would also get posted. They wouldn't be up for long before being removed with the quick and her publicist was here to do damage control stating she was obviously very tired and not thinking clearly. By this point, Mariah was in desperate need of some downtime. She tried hiding from her management team by shacking up with a trusted background vocalist before her brother, Morgan Carey, found and brought her to their mom's residence. Managing her anxiety by cleaning her mom's kitchen, before she knew it, she'd black out momentarily before being put to bed. Her first real sleep in about a week. Her deep slumber was broken by her mom who informed her that her recording company was looking for her. Mama Carrie obviously didn't get the memo. Disturbing Mariah's sleep only irritated her spirit. Her survival response kicked in immediately and out came a full-blown rage. Nobody had ever seen her in such a state before, especially not her mom Patricia, who turned into Karen real quick and ended up calling the police on her own daughter. She had been defied and I had dared to be belligerent. I was being aggressive toward her. I was scaring her. The police immediately sided with her mom. The only thing the cops saw was a scared white woman in a big house full of non-white people. Even Mariah Carey couldn't compete with a nameless white woman in distress. Just a few hours later, Mariah had been hospitalized for extreme exhaustion, emotional distress, and an ongoing physical and nervous breakdown. She was taken to what they deemed a local spot, which turned out just to be a rehab center similar to a prison or an obstacle juvenile detention center, where she was met with zero sympathy from the administrator checking her in. By this point, Mariah was 11 years deep into her career. By that summer, she had obtained 15 number ones on Billboard's Hot 100, released an album slash EP practically each year in the 90s, co-wrote and co-produced every original song she recorded, and the whole nine. Mariah had been on top of her game for years. That, on top of Tommy Mottola playing the role of single white female, talking about the movie, Mariah was anxious, paranoid, and tired. Apparently, Tommy even went as far as to take promotional items, her stand-up advertisements for example, out of record stores. Fortunately, despite Despite taking a voluntary hiatus, Glitter's debut single Lover Buddy managed to peak at number 2 on the Billboard Hot 100 despite the little promo it had gotten. Compared to the promotion earlier projects received and Virgin Records' decision to discount its CD single to 49 cents. A report in the UK tabloid The Sun, literally known for being unserious as all heck, claimed that Mariah had attempted to off herself the night of July 25th over her recent breakup with Mexican singer Luis Miguel. Her publicist denied all allegations but did state that she took her mental anguish out on dishes and glasses. Meanwhile, in the outside world, box office analysts were saying Glitter was tracking very poorly based on pre-release buzz. With chaos and pandemonium surrounding the film's debut came the paparazzi who chased after Mariah when she left the hospital on August 6th. That week, Virgin Records pushed back the soundtrack's release date to September 11th, while 20th Century Fox delayed the film from its original date of August 31st, now to September 21st. Mariah booked a trip to Los Angeles to visit her brother, who, according to her own memoir, duped her into a stint at a hardcore detox and rehab center where she was fed heavy narcotics. Mariah would then be discharged on the exact same day as the 9-11 Twin Tower terrorist attacks, which she herself found oddly coincidental. Writing in her memoir, so I was magically good to go because terrorists had attacked America and a cracked up diva wasn't interesting anymore? Hello? She would later seek estrangement from her brother, sister, and mother, referring to them now as her ex-relatives. September 11th, 2001, as you know, was a tragic day for the US and those all around the world who felt the immense impact of the ambush attacks on the Twin Towers, and it's without mentioning that that specific day may not have been the best day to release an entire album. Although, Jay-Z's The Blueprint, Nickelback's Silver Side Up, Bob Dylan's Love and Theft, Fabulous's Ghetto Fabulous, and more all came out on the exact same day and pulled far better numbers than Glitter did. The antics leading up to Glitter's release date were very well documented, plastered on the front covers of questionable tabloids and magazines convincing curious onlookers that the project was doomed from the start. Nevertheless, Mariah persevered. 
Despite the media taking a whack at an already teetering situation, she made her first public appearance at one of Glitter screenings on September 20th, rocking a black t-shirt with a bedazzled American flag stamped on its front. The next day, Glitter premiered in about 1,200 theaters, grossing $786,436 on its opening day. Mariah performs her song Hero at George Clooney's TV event, Benefit America, a tribute to heroes. Glitter was the 11th highest grossing film during its debut week and grossed an estimated $2,414,596. By its second week, it dropped 61.1% on ticket sales, ranking at number 15 at the box office. Glitter's theater run raked in less than 5 million, less than 20% of its reported 22 million budget. As of today, the movie has a rating of 6% on Rotten Tomatoes with an average score of 2.9 out of 10. 23 reviewers on Metacritic give it a 4 14 out of 100, indicating an overwhelming dislike, with most of the criticism focused on Mariah's Disney Channel acting and the script's usage of cliches. Witnessing the fall of the Mariah as they knew it, Virgin Records sought to cut ties with Dim Baby's mama, going as far to pay her a reported $28 million in order to dismiss her contract. 2001 was not so kind to Miss Carrie, but as 2002 rolled around, she signed a $7.5 million per album deal with Universal Music Group and dropped her next album, Charm Bracelet. Its lead single, Through the Rain, summarizes her perseverance. Shedding her glitter image was what Mimi was now focused on, and with Charm Bracelet, she sought to do just that. Although better, it still didn't quite hold up to what the masses knew Mariah to be. 90s Mariah was on fire. 21st century Mariah was... Flared. Going on a huge press run also didn't stop the sluggish ticket sales from her 8-month tour. Charm Bracelet wasn't the massive comeback she'd hoped it would be. Through the Rain stalled at number 81, but while she was on the prowl trying to reignite the flame that was Mariah Carey, she also took charge in reclaiming the glitter narrative. After Datelines, Matt Lauer questioned her hospitalization and its therapeutic methods, Mariah positioned herself as a human buttress for those partaking in the group therapy sessions. She also denounced glitter's intentions altogether, confessing that it started out as a concept with substance, but ended up being geared to 10 year olds, stating, it was gritless. I kind of got in over my head. While on Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen, she confessed that no one in her camp is even allowed to mention glitter or anything having to do with it, but we're gonna mention it here. Trembrisset was a dud compared to her previous albums, but in 2005, the arrival of the Emancipation of Mimi slapped Tommy Mottola's career homicide attempt in the face. The rebirth of 90s MC was officially back with a twist. It not only took the number one position on charts everywhere hostage, but ultimately ignited a pop R&B renaissance. The Emancipation of Mimi became Mariah's highest selling album in the US in a decade with hits like We Belong Together, Like That, and Shake It Off. Mariah was back in this thing like a boomerang, and Glitter was placed on the far, far back end of everyone's minds. 20 years after the release of the film, Mike writer Trey Green noted in an article that upon release, many people used the film to defame and demean Mariah, but ultimately praised the theme of the film, put yourself first, and never abandon your dreams. When Hashtag Justice for Glitter sparked a movement in 2018 and may have been seen as a silly gesture for some, but for Mariah and her lambs, it was a reignition of a once intentionally suppressed memory, at least on Mariah's end. She also surprisingly changed her whole outlook on its era, professing, it's actually a really good album on Good Morning America. I can say it, now that they got it to number one. Until 2016, she didn't sing anything from the Glitter soundtrack on her many tours. Ultimately, the hashtag has less to do with Glitter's actual material, but more so to do with the time period it enthralled in as well as the culture surrounding it. The late 90s, early 2000s celebrity worship that could quickly turn into celebrity loathing at the drop of a dime. A top before the internet dominated the mechanics of fame and celebs seized a mass amount of control over their own public images. Post 9-11 and post 2008-2009 economic recession, Hollywood backed away gradually from the idea of the star-studded, mid-budget film aimed at mature audiences. Nowadays, pop icons think Lady Gaga, Christina Aguilera, or Mary J. Blige, determined to expand their entertainment resume, won't have to endure the same fate as Mariah did. All in all, her so-called bizarre behavior wasn't that all out of the ordinary if you ask those who knew her best. In fact, some would say Mariah was simply being herself. Oh, y'all didn't know Sis could get down like that? During the first decade of her career, Mariah often appeared uncomfortable and closed off, but in 2001, she was no longer that version of herself, rather a wonky, fun, upbeat persona that she'd ever shown. The problem is you're having the real me right now, but nobody wants to really kind of go there, cause at this moment, it's a bit much. 
Her memoir reveals many revelations about that period in her life. TRL and its host may have been thoroughly surprised by the Mimi they were experiencing, but the show's producers were not. Even before 9-11, there was too much security at MTV's Times Square building for her to truly crash the joint. The ice cream escapade was hardly the sensationalized spectacle it was made out to be. TRL's atmosphere consisting of screaming teenagers in and outside of its building paired with its booming rotation of music was already chaotic as is. You'd think Mariah's uncalculated antics would fit right in. Carson would later admit to Entertainment Weekly that Mariah was visibly being pulled in a million different directions. The physical distress, high breakouts, and severe upper back and shoulder pain that all stems from it weren't just symptoms of extreme exhaustion, but of something much more severe. Somatization and even a grippling bipolar disorder that she'd gotten diagnosed with and kept well under wraps for decades. Glitter's collective disdain can arguably be justified, however, the venom spewed at Mariah's reeked of misogyny, racism, and stigma surrounding mental health. It also completely overlooked the role of national tragedy, corporate sabotage, and personal struggles that she herself would agree on. She did didn't have a breakdown, she was broken down by the very people who were supposed to keep her whole. No longer anxious to showcase her once forgotten passion project, in the end, Glitter was a troubled endeavor, further upheld by Mariah's personal trials and a national tragedy that wasn't even the wildest aspect of its rollout. We don't have to view Glitter as some revolutionary masterpiece in order to feel that justice had been served. Empathy for its creator will do just fine. After two decades, Glitter is getting the recognition it deserves and is finally being elevated to a cult classic. Knowing what we know now, like many of you who connected the dots between Mariah's fantasy film and her real life, like its original title, not all that glitters is gold. Do you think the media was too harsh on Mariah, and was the glitter film and soundtrack judged a little too unfairly? Let us know your thoughts and opinions down below in the comments, and stay tuned for more true celebrity stories.